Moses' life can be divided into three sections. The bull rushes to the palace, which is 40 years. The wilderness, which is another 40 years. And then the exodus and beyond is again another 40 years. And just as word of introduction before we read uh, the actual words uh, from Exodus 3, so far I want to say that we're two-thirds of the way through Moses' life. We've taken our time, but we've covered already 80 years, suddenly two-thirds of the way through his life. So in football terms, it's halfway through the third quarter, and Israel seems to be losing badly. Well, that's what I put in my notes originally, but I want to tell you about a comeback that took place for my team yesterday. And we were going for a, for a record 12th consecutive win, playing the mighty England, Wales against England in Cardiff. And we were, we're still losing. With six, at 68 minutes out of 80 minutes, we scored more points in the last 12 minutes than in the first 68 minutes, and we won the game. I thought you'd like to know about that, but that's a comeback, and you've got to hang in there. And I just now got a text from the try scorer, someone called Corey Hill, and uh, he used a wonderful Welsh colloquialism just now. I said, congratulations. He said, uh, got to dig in, see? which means you've got to dig in. You've got to dig in. It's like a battle. You've got to fight in there. You've got to hang in there. Uh, I hope that's a word maybe to someone. Just say to someone next to you, got to dig in, see? That made no sense whatsoever, did it? But never mind, that's okay. You get the point, though, that uh, it's late in the game, and how we finish the game really matters. And in the eyes of the world, at 80 years old, Moses is really old. There's nothing for this beautiful boy, a former royal who killed a man, living in obscurity, wrinkled by the sun, possessing little, maybe with a sore back, but maybe there's something deep within his soul that knows there's a little more to his life. And that's how we come to Exodus 3 verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned, everyone say concerned, about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you've brought the people out of Egypt you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And all God's people said, This is one of the most important moments in spiritual history. So far, the wheels of history seem to have been moving slowly till suddenly this day, God bursts in on the scene with a clear directive to Moses. The end of chapter two, God has heard the cry of the Israelites. It may have seemed to have taken, bless you, by the way. He may have taken some time. 
Uh, we, we sometimes feel like God is a God of silence, but God is never the God of absence. He's a God who does speak and does know our situation, so we must be present to hear. Here we're going to see a God of holiness, but also a God of hope and a God who commands our attention. The God of Exodus 3, by the way, has not changed. He always works to save. The God of Exodus 3 actually is here today by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and he still burns bushes in our hearts. I want to encourage you that Exodus 3 is here for us to remind us that God is an intervening God. He's an awesome God, and he's a present God. He's also the same God. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can we just say, same God? He is the same God. You know, our children used to sing a song at our former church many years ago from Hebrews 13, 8, the verse I've just quoted. We believe in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is never out of date. Hey, let's give him praise that he is the same God who's here today. And here in the desert, God breaks through. And I want to encourage you that God can find us in whatever situation we are in today. God found Jonah on a boat and then sent a storm. And then, in fact, he found Jonah under the water with seaweed wrapped around his head. Therefore, God can find any of us, no matter how far we've fallen or however desperate we are, God can be close today. Moses has been Jethro's assistant shepherd for 14,600 days, and there was nothing in particular about that day that suggested that this day would be any different, but God determined on this day that he would break in. Now, it's a bit of a mystery to us that an angel of Yahweh appears. It's a mystery to us how God appears in the burning bush, and we call this a theophany, which means an appearance of God, but there's also a sense of mystery that we simply cannot explain it. What we do know is that God has manifested himself above all in Jesus Christ, that God came to earth in Jesus Christ, and that should be the Christian's main point of attention, but this is a wonderful hint of what is yet to come, that our God, the Lion and the Lamb, has, has come to Moses and is caring for his people. Here's the first thing I want to say this morning, friend. God gets Moses attention, verse one to six. This whole section is the Lord in essence saying, well, this is the man to set my people free. Now, how am I going to communicate this message to this old shepherd who thinks there's nothing new under the sun? Moses has run away from Egypt. He's been there for a staggering 40 years in the desert. He kind of deliberately sets himself up to not be disturbed by public life, which meant he was even off social media for all that time. He could assume that this part of his life was over. A life of promise was now drab and routine. By the way, I assumed that Tiger Woods wouldn't be able to compete at the highest level again after all those knee surgeries and back surgeries and nerve damage. Golf is a hard game. The sport moves on. But Tiger came to Atlanta in the summer and uh, he won that tournament with great thrill. And uh, people would say, Tiger's 43 years old. And uh, I want to say that Moses is 80 years old here. And people weren't expecting a comeback from Moses. Give me a woo on that one as well. <laughs> Perhaps Moses could recall the bull rushes, the palace life, the princess, the pharaoh, his family. And now it seems like a distant memory. But let me tell you, friends, God does not waste the desert experience in my life and in your life. God teaches us much in the university of life, not so much when things go really well, but when things don't go so well. That's often when we learn the most and we surrender to God the most. Matthew Henry says on this passage, the shepherds were keeping their flocks, keeping watch over their flocks when they received the tidings of the Savior's birth. Isn't it interesting that Moses was also watching over flocks that day as well? You know, he'd been there so long, he was beginning to look like Charlton Heston. Uh, he, was, he was looking like the Count of Monte Cristo and maybe even Tom Hanks on Castaway Island. And so he'd been there a long, long time. We get the sense of that. But God is, is schooling Moses in the wilderness. You see, those 40 years in the palace were going to prepare him to confront Pharaoh. And those 40 years in the wilderness were preparing him how to lead an entire nation through the wilderness till they got to the edge of the promised land. 
Taking time is okay. Obscurity is okay. We're often so much in a rush to get our dream that we miss our destiny. In our impatience, we lurch from idea to idea and don't always see things through. We look for greener grass, but let me tell you something. If you're running from God to find that greener grass, there'll be desert on the other side because God will get you out of the desert when he's finished with you being in the desert. God's time is not always our time. I got an amen from that one as well. Chuck Swindoll says on this passage, God notices us in the desert as much as at any time. And yet we're in the desert, we think God doesn't notice, he doesn't know what's going on. Let me tell you, he knew what was going on with Jonah under the water, with Moses in the desert, so therefore he knows what's going on in your life and my life as well. Does that encourage you? Be encouraged that God knows and he's using these painful times, these frustrating times for the glory of his name. You know, I believe he's making us as a church in the era that we're living in, in this strange time, that we've been living in in recent years, recent decades, I believe that the church is gonna come out brighter and bolder than ever before, and we're gonna become more and more like Jesus. Can I have an amen on that too? God can use ordinary things. You see, when the bush burned, that was quite an ordinary experience. Bushes would often combust like that in that incredible dry desert heat. God can use ordinary things. There may be a crisis. Sometimes God can even speak through your children. Have you noticed that? And sometimes it's almost like, why are you doing that, Daddy? And God speaks to us when we realize, I don't have an answer for that. We may have made a mistake, and our conscience pricks us like Jiminy Cricket. God can speak through the ordinary, but God also speaks through the extraordinary because this ordinary bush burns, and then it continues to burn, and it burns on, and its lamp keeps burning, and it was not consumed. There are no ashes, and so there is this sustained supernatural burning that goes on. Can I say, it's, it lasted Moses' lifetime. And that burning continues in the church of Jesus Christ. We got the fire of God. When the disciples met Jesus and realized it was Jesus on the Emmaus Road, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? God does that. There's an extraordinary burning. For 40 years, I've been following Jesus. Let me tell you, I'm as enthusiastic about Jesus today that at any point in my life. Do you know that burning? Do you know the burning of Christ in your heart that says nothing matters more than worshiping God, adoring him, and knowing him in each situation in my life? Let God's speaking to you be also extraordinary, my friend. Sometimes it begins with curiosity, verse 3. Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. And so this fire burns, a fire of purification, an awesome fire of the holiness of God. And when the Lord saw that Moses is there, interesting human description here. God sees Moses go a little closer to the bush, and then, then his time is there. After those 80 years of preparation, Moses Moses. God speaks, and he speaks your name as well, Moses. When God speaks to you, what should you do? Here I am. Don't put your hands over the ears. Don't run away. Just stay where God has placed you and listen to what he has to say. Then verse 5, do not come any closer. This teaches us that God is holy. We live in this free and easy day when we can come and go as we please Maybe we're tempted to think I can take a little bit of God here, a little bit of Jesus there. I can fashion my own life, and if there's a little bit left over, I'll give it to God. But Moses can't do that. Here I am. He recognizes the awesome power of God, and everything must stop. God is not like a shop or a store within which we can browse. He is God. He's the creator of all matter, and he's the giver of all life. Nothing exists that was not first created. Nothing continues unless it's been sustained by God himself. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moses must remove the unclean from him. Like Isaiah, when Isaiah saw also an incredible picture of God in heaven, Isaiah immediately becomes aware of himself and says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I've got a dirty mouth. I need to be purified. I need to be cleansed. And Moses is told, God instructs him, you need to take off your shoes and recognize my holiness. Do you agree with me in our nation right now that we've lost a sense of reverence for the things of God? We've forgotten how to blush. Sin is celebrated and purity is mocked. 
Now, some people have spoken in those terms, confusing reverence with musical style or the clothes that we wear on a Sunday. Those that talk this way, whether it's to defend being cool or defend being traditional, those who talk this way have missed the whole point because worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. Well, there needs to be more reverence, meaning they should wear a jacket. There needs to be, oh, they're, they're just not cool, they're so traditional, they don't wear enough ripped jeans. That's just immature talk that completely misses the point. The point is that God is real. And we need to be more aware, surely, of the manifest presence of God wherever we go. Yes, especially on the day of worship and praise. We come prepared. We come with sins confessed. We come with open hearts ready to serve God and to give him what he tells us to give. We adore and worship him. And yes, we even confess our sins and ask him to wash us clean. Moses moves from mild curiosity to captivation with the awesome holy presence of God. Can God get our attention today? Surely he does command our attention. Surely if we're followers of Jesus, everything should stop and we should be saying, God, it's you and me. It's us and you. You are the awesome God. We love you. We adore you. We thank you for manifesting your presence through Jesus Christ, through his life and death and resurrection. Can we give him awesome and reverent praise right now and acknowledge the holiness of God today? So God certainly has Moses' attention, but he doesn't do this just for the thrill of it. By the way, you and I are not filled with the Holy Spirit just so that we can have a good day. We're not filled with the Holy Spirit so we can just have a good time of praise. We're not filled with the Spirit so that we can just have peace and love and joy. We're filled with the Spirit because God has given us a purpose, and so the Spirit empowers us for the mission that God has given every one of us. So secondly, God has a purpose for his people. It's not just about Moses. We're tempted very often to individualize everything because we're a very individualistic culture. And there's good parts of that and there's a part of that that's not so good. It's not good if we're a follower of Jesus Christ and we think that it's just about me and Jesus. It's about me and Jesus and the mission of God. And so what follows is God's word about the people of God. It's not about Moses' comfort or pleasure because if it were about Moses' comfort and pleasure, he would just stay with his family and live out his days in that desert heat. But God has a huge challenge coming up for Moses because it's all about the people. Instead of being individualistic, we need to be more peopleistic, focused on the mission of God. I made that word up, by the way. And so verse seven and onwards, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering, says the Lord. This is an insight into the very heart of God How does God feel? Well, God loves his people. God hears his people crying out. We thank God for Israel. We thank God that we also have been engrafted into that by the grace of God. And so God sees believers all over the world as his people and his children. And God is concerned for us and concerned that many more will join us before Christ returns. And so he proposes a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is God's plan for the people. Now, I asked the South Campus this question, and I got a majority, uh, actually uh, an overwhelming majority on this. But let me ask you a question. First of all, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Please put your hands in the air if you believe yourself to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And hold it there so I can just see. Hands down. Okay, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, do you accept that God has given us a shared purpose? If so, put your hands in the air. That's every one of us. That's the right answer. If we're following Jesus, it's not just about me going to heaven. It's about me doing God's will. In fact, us doing God's will till Christ returns. That's what happens at the burning bush. God gets Moses' attention and then says, there's a job for you to do, and I'm going to give you what you need in order to fulfill your life purpose. What a great life purpose you have. And can I even say, my friend, That as you think about your dream and your destiny and all the stuff that you want to accomplish in life, God has such a big plan which involves all of us together. I can't fulfill my purpose without you. You can't fulfill your purpose without one another. Our life purpose is intimately wrapped up with the people of God. That's actually a wonderfully liberating thing because it's not all about me. It becomes all about us and it ultimately becomes all about him. Can we give him praise for the purpose that he's given every one of us? Thirdly, 
Thirdly, this conversation carries on. God is revealing himself, revealing his purposes in this holy conversation from verse 7 to 10. And verse 14, God wants us to know who he is. And in this very human conversation with the supernatural God, how patiently the Lord listens to Moses and how patiently he listens to you and I. He is susceptible to our prayers. Moses talks with him, and essentially Moses is saying, well, who are you, Lord? And what shall I say to the people? How can I describe you? How can I, what is your name? And the Lord's comfort, first of all, verse 12, before he even gives the name is, look, it should be enough for you that I'm going to be with you. I will be with you. What's your name? I will be with you. God will be with you. Lord, how is this going to happen? I will be with you. How am I going to answer my persecutors when the persecution comes? How am I going to deal with that? I will be with you, says the Lord. In fact, you won't even have to worry about what you're going to have to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need. God's presence is such a comfort. There is no situation whereby God will not be present in your life. I mean, don't run from God like Jonah, but to get right with God. But if we're walking with Christ, he's going to be with us in all situations. But then the Lord does graciously reveal his name. Verse 14, he says, I am who I am which breaks all the grammatical rules, wasn't, doesn't it? No one's ever been described in that way before. I am who I am. You may have a little note in your Bible that says it can also mean uh, I will be who I will be, and there are other ways of trying to understand this. It's a very mysterious phrase. I am who I am. Yahweh, he reveals himself as the great I am. There's only one other person in history who has also spoken with grammatical impossibility because he's simply indescribable. When they asked Jesus, who are you? Do you know what Jesus said in John 8, verse 58? Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Notice the family resemblance, that our God has a mysterious name. He is the great I am, the one who always has been and always is and always shall be, the God who was and is and is to come. What an awesome God. It's hard for us to comprehend the eternity of God who is before us for an eternity and, and with us now and shall be always into all eternity. The same one who says, I am, also said, in terms that we can understand, I am the good shepherd. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the way and the truth and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you know him? Do you know this mysterious, awesome, powerful God? Do you know that he has revealed himself in the great I am, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for you? We can know the great I am. Tell, one, tell someone next to you right now, you can know God. You just tell them that you can know God. There's no mystery about this. He's already revealed himself. We can know the living God. Can we give him praise one more time, everyone, that we can know him today? Do you know him? Finally, and this is... This is not a sermon without this. No sermon can ever stop at this point alone. Fourthly, God is waiting for our response. God is waiting to see what Moses is going to do. Now, next week is D now. Let's give it up for D now. We're excited about that. We're anticipating more than 1,000 students than when you add all the workers, around about 1,600 people to be here on Friday night and Saturday morning. May God have all the glory. May God have all the praise. And we wish God's blessing upon all our local churches in this community for a very sweet time. Bless all the host homes. We, uh, we know that it's a, a crazy day that we live in, but we care for the safety of all our under-18s at the highest level. And uh, so we just ask for God's richest blessing upon this uh, incredible ministry that's going to take place. Next Sunday, I'm going to call it the excuses talk, because when we get into chapter 4, Moses comes up with all the objections and all the excuses as to why he should do anything or should not do anything. And there's a hint of that struggle in verse 11. It's not yet really revealed itself yet, but in verse 11, Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And the Lord says, let me give you a sign. Here's the sign about your response. The sign will come after you've obeyed me. The sign will come when you're going to show up at this very place that I'm speaking to you, at this very bush that I speak to you right now, here at the Mount of God, Horeb, the sign will be that you're going to arrive here with an entire nation. Then you will know that I've called you. 
We want to know the success now. Give me the guarantees now. God says, here's the guarantee. I'll be with you, and you're going to bring the nation here. That's my sign that when you get here with the people, you'll go, oh, this is true all along. Now, there will be 10 plagues along, uh, all along the way. There will be the Passover. They'll cross the Red Sea, pillar of fire, all that stuff going on. But God says, you'll really know when you've obeyed me till you see what I will accomplish. And we say, God, uh, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to do this. And God says, I want you to do this, and you'll know that I'm in it when the fruit comes. But I want to see it now. God says, no, you just need a lifetime of obedience first, and then you'll see the glory. And then I'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. But I want to see it now. In fact, I'm going to give up if I don't see it. I've been doing this for like six months. And God says, Try another 40 years of obedience. And then you'll see, then you'll see, my friend, when you come back to this holy mountain. Oh, we're in such a rush, aren't we? Oh, the grass looks so nice over there. Let me say it again. It will be desert if you go and God does not lead you there. We've got to make sure that we obey him. He called us to cross the other side of the sea, but I tell you what, we crossed the other side of the sea because God told us and it would have been disobedient to have stayed. We've got to obey him. And let me tell you, we stay unless God calls us, amen? Moses, it, Moses' inadequacy faces God's complete adequacy, and God says to you today, my friend, I will be with you. I am with you, and I will be with you. But this is hard being bereaved, yes, but I will be with you, and you shall see my glory, and you shall worship together on that mountain. And in fact, we will all be gathered together and worship him for all time. What will be the sign? The sign will be mission accomplished, proof in the pudding. Men will mock. I'll say this, friend. I don't think God's done anything in my life of any note that has not been mocked by men. Everything that God has led me into, that's, I think, kingdom business Men have mocked along the way. But I tell you, let me tell you, it's not about men mocking. It's about pleasing God, amen? And if you'll please God, you will see the glory because there's glory ahead. Louise and I uh, were on holiday with our friends Colin and Nettie, Colin and Annette. About three years after we were married, we went to the island of Guernsey just off France. And uh, we were, you know, two couples of newlyweds. It was a camping holiday, but we had enough money for an entire evening out at a restaurant. And we were gonna really live it up that night. It was like 20 bucks a head. We were really going for it. And so we sit in this restaurant. I'm here, Louise is there. There's Colin and Annette. And I suddenly catch Colin's face. He's looking behind me, and there's a look of horror on his face. I'm thinking, what's wrong with Colin? Maybe you know, he's eaten too much you know, uh, steak or something. He, his face looked quite strange. And he looked horrified, and then suddenly he, Colin goes, Sir! And he points over my shoulder and I turn around and there's this guy, it's like a comic scene, there's this guy reading a newspaper at the table. He was on his own, reading a newspaper. There's a candle on the table. His newspaper is on fire and he doesn't even realize it. He's like reading the paper, maybe it was a trick of the lights or something, but the paper is on fire. And so Colin goes, Sir! And that guy looks over his paper like, who is this annoying person trying to get my attention? puts the paper back. He still can't see that the paper is burning. I, I don't know how he missed it, but I've got a, I've got a witness here. Uh, eventually, it was like a, a great comic scene. The waiter runs on with one of those soda bottles, you know, when they're squirting soda bottles. It was almost like, yes, I was born to do this, you know? <laughs> and the guy kind of runs on. <laughs> and the man in the paper is going <laughs> like this. <laughs> the steam and the smoke rises. And the man kind of looked at us with half of his paper left, and he still seemed to be annoyed with us all. It was like, like that. And it was almost like he didn't want to hear, and he didn't want to do anything. Do you know why? I think he was proud. I think he was proud. He wanted to be cool because I'm a big guy, and I got my paper on my arm. Here I am in this fancy restaurant that they can only afford to go once in their lifetime, and here I am. <laughs> they didn't want to hear. And they didn't want to, he didn't want to do anything. John 20, 21, Jesus said, peace be with you. Oh, that's nice. I like a bit of peace. Yeah, I'll take peace. I'll have peace. Thank you. That's all I need. I just need peace. Did Jesus say anything else? As the Father has sent me. As the Father has sent me. And where does he go? To the cross? Resurrect. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
Can I just have the peace? Uh, but I, I don't want to really hear much more than that. I just want peace. I don't want to hear any more. I don't want to do anything more about that. And I got some training in discipleship this week. So now I know, Tim, what it's all about. This disciple trainer basically said to us, discipleship's really simple. It's just two things. Hearing and doing. We hear in the big picture. This keeps us tuned up. Sometimes it's a breakthrough moment. Let me tell you, though, David, uh, with World Discipleship Association, yourself and Bob Dukes, what you do in the small group, what we do in our family groups, what we do on a Wednesday night, that's another really important hearing thing that takes place. But if we're a disciple and we only hear, but we don't do, and we don't grow, and we don't see things in ourselves that need purifying and refining, we don't need to kind of, if we miss that there are moments when we need to get back on track because we got stuck in a negative rut, if we're not hearing and doing, hearing and doing, hearing and doing, do you know what? We're not a disciple. This man didn't want to hear or do, and Moses now has the opportunity, having met with the awesome God and heard of his name, and been given a clear vision and mission, Moses now has to decide, will I hear and will I do? And we're going to see next week that he puts up quite a fight till eventually God says, we're going to do this thing. But the Lord does say in this passage, you're going to come back to the mountain, this very mountain, and mission will be accomplished. So how about you and I? Can we allow the bush to burn in our hearts right now as our musicians come? Can we just ask this awesome, holy God to manifest his presence in the church today? Can we do that?